Let's look at putting into practice what's called derived alternate airport minimums for IFR for an air carrier. If the air carrier has the appropriate op spec, then it can use this table in order to figure out its own alternate airport weather minimums, what's required for the air carrier to use the airport. So you can read this table on your own, but basically um, we are going to step through it in practice. So here's what uh, many pilots are going to be used to looking at to figure out their alternate minimums. We have a section down here that says for filing as alternate. And that's all fine if you are flying under Part 91. However, the reason we don't use this data for air carriers is because we can get minimums that are most likely lower than 600 foot ceiling and 2 miles visibility for our alternates by using our op spec and doing what's called derived alternate minimums. So the only thing that we're using this data down here for is to notice that we cannot um, file this alternate using, for example, only this NDB approach because we have an NA. Now if the whole airport down here has nothing except for NA on this 10.9A page, then this whole airport may not be used when we're figuring out our alternate minimums for an air carrier. However, there's not a whole lot of airports like that. It's just something to notice. So next few slides, we're going to show exactly how we do this. So we're looking at Salt Lake, uh, or San Jose, California, rather. Here is the rule. If we have a single approach for an airport into a single runway, we take whatever our um, MDA above the ground and our visibility, and we add 400 feet to our level off altitude for the approach and one mile to our visibility requirement. So in this example, um, it's a little covered up by the box, but this says 566, 566 right there. And we actually round that up to 600. So to 600, we're gonna get, we're gonna add 400 feet this came from the table that I showed you a few slides ago. It's printed in the op specs at the airline. So we add 600 feet to that, and then we are gonna add one mile to our mile and a quarter visibility. So here's our mile and a quarter visibility right here. We have a category D aircraft, a mile and a quarter plus one mile. One mile came again from that table that we looked at before for deriving our alternate minimums. So at, once we add these things together, we now have an alternate minimum for San Jose, California, using only the localizer DME and runway 30 left, our alternate minimum is now 1,000 foot ceiling and two and a quarter miles for the time when we are supposed to be arriving at that alternate. Now you might say, that's not very good. That's pretty high ceiling, that's pretty high visibility, and you would be right. So let's take a look at how we can get this alternate minimum lower because that, that is really a high alternate minimum and not very good. Let's look at it uh, in, in perspective of an ILS. An ILS is going to give us the best uh, alternate minimums typically. Uh, again, we have one approach listed for San Jose. If we use our single approach rule, we add 400 feet again and one mile. So let's step through this in practice. Uh, <clears throat> for this one, we have 200 feet for our decision height from right there, 200 feet. And we're gonna add one mile to the half mile right there. And so we would then end up with 600 foot ceiling and one and a half miles. So this is this is great. Um, the only problem is, say, say we're looking at San Jose, and for some reason today our ILS is out of service, or the glide slope is out of service. So this is fine, um, but if we're only looking at one approach, then we may not be able to use it to figure out our alternate and get a, a lower alternate minimum. So moving on from this, 
And uh, if, if, you, if you're going to become a dispatcher, deriving alternate minimums is a good bit of what the dispatcher is going to do. Uh, dispatchers are, need to know this skill, so it is good for dispatchers to practice. And if you take a dispatch course, you will practice this a good amount until you are comfortable with it. This what's called deriving alternate minimums. So now let's use our double approach rule. We got that again from the table a few slides back. So if we have two different approaches using two different runways, which could be the same strip of pavement, but we have two different ends here. We have one, two right, and we have three, zero left. In the world of this, that's two different runways. So we have two different runways and important, we have two different navigational facilities going on. We have an ILS and we have a localizer DME. We've got different frequencies for each of these, so that's two different nav aids. So not only just two approaches, we've got two different nav aids, we've got two different runways that we're using. If all that is met, great, we can do our double approach mode. And what we would do for that is add 200 feet to the highest of the different decision heights and we add half a mile to the highest of our visibility. So in this case, we have to look at our localizer DME to three zero left. Um, and over here, we've got this 566 again, and then one and a quarter here. But in this case, um, we're again, we're adding 200 feet and half a mile. So we end up in this one getting 800 foot required ceiling and one and three quarters miles. Now, you might say, oh, but when we used our single approach rule using only this ILS, we added 400 feet to our 200 foot decision height and we actually had an alternate minimum of 600 foot ceiling. And you'd write, that would be better. In this case, it's actually better to use the single approach rule for San Jose and for this ILS. But again, just an example. This is how the double approach rule works. All right, so now let's take a look at how you can get the lowest possible alternate minimums. And the lowest possible alternate minimums are available to you generally using two ILSs to two different runways. And again, making sure that we have a different localizer frequency, a different nav aid being used. Now this one's really unique. We have two of the same frequency. They're both 110.9, but we have different identifiers, ISJC and ISLV. So I would consider this to be two different nav aids. And we have two different runways, so we are allowed to use our double approach mode um, to figure out our alternate minimums. So. We add 200 feet to the higher of the two decision heights, but these are both 200 feet. You can see here we have 200 feet here, 200 feet here, and then adding half a mile to the higher of these two, and they are both one half. Great. So we add one half to one half, 200 to 200, and we end up with 401. Now, 401 is sort of like the big quest of the dispatcher. The dispatcher wants to get as many alternates at 401 as possible, because 401 is basically the lowest alternate minimums you can get for the air carrier with this derived alternate minimums. Now keep in mind through all this that your aircraft has to actually be able to fly both of these approaches. For example, if we have a 20 knot headwind on runway 1, 2 right, that's going to be a 20 knot tailwind on runway 3, 0 left, and that is probably outside the limitations of the aircraft. So we cannot always just use both ILSs, but given a certain circumstances or an airport with lots of runways going the same direction, big airports like DFW, O'Hare, Atlanta, uh, we are very often able to get 401 for our derived alternate minimums, which is, which is our goal.